Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Seip from Norwegian University of Science and Technology, who will speak on contractive inequalities for hardy spaces. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be with you. Um, so I will uh, speak about contractive inequalities for hardy spaces and uh, since you are all experts on analytic function spaces, uh, I guess. Uh, ah, yeah, no, let's see, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I need to uh, define them. Uh, probably I should. We are on the on the on the on the D torus, T D. Uh, P is uh, between one and infinity, and H P of uh, T D is the closure of the analytic polynomials in LP on, on the torus, uh, where we uh, compute uh, integrals with respect to Haar measure, or uh, it's, it's just product measure of, of, uh, un, of, of Lebesgue measure on the, on the circles, uh, un, um, normalized uh, to have uh, measure one. And, uh, and uh, H infinity is just the space of bounded analytic functions uh, in the interior, in, in the polydisc. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, of course, you can also alternatively uh, define them um, in terms of uh, uh, the Fourier coefficient. So, so f is in um, is in H uh, HP if uh, the uh, Fourier coefficient uh, uh, associated with the uh, uh, signed multi-index, right? Alpha, alpha one to alpha d uh, uh, is um, zero whenever uh, we are outside of what, uh, well, what we often call the narrow cone, which means that we are outside of, 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 the, of the part of the, of, uh, of the d-dimensional space where the, um, where, where the entries, where, where let's say a one, at least one entry is, uh, is negative. So all, all the entries are uh, non-negative. Okay, so uh, then, uh, then we have another space uh, which uh, I call curly HP, uh, which is which is uh, just HP uh, of the infinite uh, dimensional torus in disguise. Uh, we define it uh, in the following way: uh, we take the closure of Dirichlet polynomials, uh, polynomials, uh, Dirichlet polynomials of this form, and uh, finite sum uh, a n n to the minus s uh, with respect to the so-called Besicevich norm. So we look at it on the uh, imaginary axis. We take the integral mean uh, of the pth power uh, when t goes to infinity. And uh, this is for finite p and for h infinity, curly h infinity, uh, uh, those uh, are, are, is the space of Dirichlet series that represent bounded analytic functions in the right half plane. Uh, there is the way to get from, from, from uh, uh, this space, hp on the torus, to the space of Dirichlet series is to use the, um, is a, uh, or, or, Rather the other way, yeah, to, to get from curly HP to HP on the torus, sorry, you use the so-called Bohr lift, which means that you send uh, for each prime, PJ, you take PJ to the minus S and send it to ZJ, uh, the Jth variable, and that sets up an isometric isomorphism of a curly HP onto HP on the torus. I like... Uh, to think of this, I mean, you have two different ways of representing the same object, and I like to think of it uh, in, there is an anal analog to the Riemann zeta function. As you know, you can represent the Riemann zeta function either as an Euler product, so you have a multiplicative um, representation, or you can look at it as a Dirichlet series. So you can think of the representation of our space on the torus as the multiplicative uh, representation and curly HP as the sort of additive uh, representation in analogy with what you have for Riemann zeta. 
And, well, we all know that we have a pretty good understanding of the what goes on in dimension one. But uh, in comparison, our comprehension of the case uh, when D is larger than one, that is uh, much more rudimentary. Uh, so what uh, this, this, this topic, um, uh, I, I think one could say, begins somehow with uh, work done by Bayar uh, 20 years ago, then later by Helsen. Uh, so what, what Bayar and, and, and later Helsen did was to, to observe that contractive inequalities involving norms of our hardware spaces can be particularly useful when the objects in question, like the norms, or it could also be an underlying operator, when these objects lift in a multiplicative way from one or sometimes few uh, to several or sometimes infinitely many variables. And, uh, and, and that has really been my motivation for, for looking more, or trying to look more systematically at various contractive inequalities for these spaces. So I will try to, to tell you about uh, several joint papers. Uh, one in collaboration with Konyagin, Kefelek, and Saxman, and uh, uh, two others with uh, Breivik and uh, Ortega Seda. So, okay, so on, on this slide, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to say what one could possibly gain from, from, from taking this viewpoint. So the first point I wish to make is that taking this infinite dimensional viewpoint, which begins with Bayar and Helsen, you, you get a new perspective on problems, even in dimension one. So you see problems in dimension one that you wouldn't, uh, that you didn't see before. And the, 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 the prime example of that is what I will call Hardy Littlewood uh, inequalities. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, then there are very interesting phenomena appearing in the transition from finite to infinite dimension. And, and the example I will uh, use for that is uh, Ries projection um, with, and, and operators with quite unusual LP boundedness properties. And then I would say that there are some in interesting well, there are there, at least to me some surprises that there are actually things going on in the transition from low via intermediate to high dimension, and uh, that uh, the the topic here is uh, idempotent Fourier multipliers. And finally, uh, um, I will say a few words at the end about uh, 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 a certain variant of this which I think perhaps may uh, throw some, some light on the monarch space geometry, uh, something which we call Hilbert points. So I will, so the talk is divided into four sections corresponding to these four points that I'm trying to make. So let's begin with uh, the Hardy-Littlewood inequalities. Uh, that's a very classical, uh, subject. Um, there is a there is a uh, this a nice inequality that you probably have seen before. Goes back to to Carleman. Uh, so you have a, a power series um, representing an analytic function in the unit disk, and and then you have this relation uh, between uh, the square sum with these weights um, n plus one in the denominator and the h one norm. So this is the embedding of the hardy space, uh, or sorry, the embedding of H1 in, in the hardy space, uh, the usual hardy space A2. And what Helsen did in 2006 was by, let's say, clever mul multiplicative iteration of uh, Minkowski's inequality. He lifted this inequality to an infinite dimensional inequality where you then instead of this weighted sum on the left hand side have a 
So now, now you're, you are plugging in a, a Dirichlet series or you start from a Dirichlet series, right? F of S is a, Dirich, uh, is a Dirichlet series. So it comes with its coefficients Cn. So now you have the square sum of the coefficients of your Dirichlet series and instead of n plus one, you have in the, in the denominator, the divisor function, the divisor function that counts the number of divisors of the uh, positive integer n. And on the right hand side, you have just uh, the, the Bohr lift of, of uh, the Dirichlet series computed on the, uh, on, uh, or, or the H1 norm of, of, of that on the torus. So uh, that is a uh, Helsinki inequality. And uh, he used it uh, to prove a certain thing about the uh, Nahari theorem, namely that it, uh, it holds for multiplicative Hunkel forms uh, in, in the Hilbert Schmidt class. Uh, well, the inequality has an obvious number theoretic appeal. And it has been used in, in the study of, of so-called pseudo moments of, of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, but uh, we do not quite have what we would like to have, because in this setting, it's very natural to have an HP analog. And the HP analog of Coleman is uh, in when, when you start in, in the disk in one dimension, it should look like like this, as, as this inequality one. So now instead of n plus one, uh, you have uh, the, uh, bi the bin binomial coefficient that you, that you see here. And well, uh, well, let's say this, is, this should be true. And I believe quite strongly that it is true, uh, but we have only a proof when one over p is a positive integer. And this goes back to Bourbia in 1987. But we have also strong numerical evidence that it holds for all p. Uh, well, if you had this, then you would have a, another interesting uh, inequality if you lift it in the same way as Helsen did with now, uh, 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 again, uh, device a function in, in the uh, denominator. Uh, in fact, these the divisor, the, this device function are the coefficients of uh, the a power of the Riemann zeta function. So this would be uh, would be a nice result to have, but unfortunately we, we do not have it. Uh, we have some weaker inequalities. Uh, there is a one which you can obtain from uh, Sobolov inequality of Weisler from 1980. But so it agrees with the inequality I had on the previous slide, but then the, re the remaining weights of the ANs decay exponentially. So you don't get what you, what you really want. Then uh, there is a result by uh, Kulikov who found a better inequality, which also agrees with, with ours in the first two tele coefficients, but with the remaining weights being, let's say the right ones up to uh, multiplication by some constant. There, I should also say, I, I didn't put it on the slide, but, but the, if you look at, I mean, there are, there are you can, of course, there are results about which constant you could put in front here. And uh, there have been improvements. So I think the last improvement is by Adrian Lineares. And I, I, I don't remember the exact number of decimals, but he has something like 1.0. And I think he had, has another zero. And, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, there, there, I think in the third decimal, there is something which is not zero. OK, so that's what we know. Uh, there is another formulation which I, I like very much uh, in terms of reproducing or, or a, an extremal problem that you expect to be solved by reproducing kernels. So it's a Hilbert space, uh, let's say, uh, more a Hilbert space geometry point of view. So uh, this is from a paper I wrote with uh, Breivik, Ortega, Sarda and Chao. And what we did was to prove that this inequality that I have been talking about for all p between two, 0 and 2 would follow if uh, the reproducing kernels of H2 
solve the problem of maximizing the hyperbolic area in the Poincaré disk model of uh, the set where this uh, where f uh, the models of f squared then uh, and then we put a weight which corresponds to the weight of uh, sorry the the norm of the point evaluation at points in h2 right so you put on on, on let's say the right weight and and then you look at at the set where this is larger than some lambda times uh, the norm squared of the function and uh, well this is a mobius invariant uh, uh, problem so you uh, so you and, and well, what we strongly believe is that it is solved by reproducing kernels. I find this a very attractive formulation, and it's it, it's uh, and and again, uh, there is strong uh, or let's say convincing numerical evidence in favor of it. So I, 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 I it expresses a strong geometric localization property of of reproducing kernels. Um, which I think it would be very nice to to have. So this is I, I, I mentioned these things to inspire you to to think about them. I think these are very nice uh, problems, um, but presumably not so easy. Okay, so let's go to the next topic, um, uh, which is about um, the uh, risk projection. So I, I guess this is a, a well-known um, uh, operator. We have um, a function, let's say in L1, represented by it, its Fourier series. So we take the, the orthogonal projection where we keep only uh, the frequencies with non-negative, uh, where all the, all the uh, indices are non-negative. Uh, and as an operator on L2, of course, it has norm one. Uh, and and um, if we instead view um, the, it as an operator on LP, then there is a theorem of Hollenbeck and Verbitsky. Well, actually, that's a theorem for dimension one, but it lifts um, in in a in a straightforward way to to dimension D. And you know then what the norm of the operator is in dimension D. But if you go to infinite dimension. Um, then obviously uh, risk projection is bounded on LP only when P is two and then its norm is, is one. So, so there is nothing interesting happening in, in the transition to infinite dimension if we consider risk projection in the usual way as a map from LP to LP. So what we could do instead is to look at it as, as a, an operator from one LP from LQ to LP, where Q is larger than or equal to P. And uh, by Holder's inequality, um, the uh, norm, I, and now I, I will actually have, I, I would like to take Q to be infinite, okay? So when we uh, look at this function, uh, we look at the norm for, for various P, it's clear that it is a continuous and non-decreasing function. And from the previous slide, we have a trivial upper bound. I mean, uh, given what we know about uh, HP, it, uh, it's clear that uh, when we start at uh, H in um, L infinity, uh, we will have a smaller norm. So the, it has to be bounded by this. Uh, the, then we can define uh, the so-called critical exponent of Ries projection which means that we take the supremum over all p larger than or equal to two, such that uh, this norm is less than or equal to one. And, and uh, it's clear that when p is two, uh, it, this is the, the norm is one. So, so uh, this is well-defined. This is well-defined. Okay, so uh, I, I started looking at this uh, about 10 years ago and I, 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 with uh, Joy de Marzo. And uh, what we found was that in dimension one, uh, the critical exponent is exactly four. And for higher dimensions, uh, we, we could, you could prove that it was actually 
less than four. And we could say something about uh, how, if, it's, if it tended to, to two, then how quickly it could tend to two. Um, and then the problem remained for some years, but and now uh, with, uh, uh, in this four author paper, uh, we managed to, to show that in fact, what happens here is that uh, this PD goes to two when, the, uh, when D goes to infinity. So P infinity is equal to two. Um, uh, and then uh, I would like to, to draw your attention to a consequence of that, which shows a, a rather interesting contrast between dimension one and uh, infinite dimension. So how can we think of L infinity here? Well, since the analytic dual of H1 equals uh, the Ries projection of L infinity, right? We find that the, the dual space of H1 is not contained in any HP space when, when for any P larger than two. So this is really in contrast with what you have in, in dimension one where uh, the, uh, uh, where the uh, dual space is BMOA and this is certainly contained in the, in the intersection of all HP spaces. So uh, then uh, I probably shouldn't spend too much time on, on, on the proof. Uh, let me just say that it is to me a quite surprising consequence of, uh, of um, uh, an old result by Ilian about spherical Lebesgue constants. So, uh, well, uh, probably I, sh I shouldn't get too technical here, but uh, I just wanted to mention that, that this is what goes into the, into the proof. So it's sort of, um, um, it has a, it has a, has a, uh, I, I think it's an interesting application of, of, of this result of Indian. Okay, so let me uh, then go to the third topic, uh, which, uh, well, actually there is a, <laughs> you, you could see that we are dealing with uh, Fourier multipliers here in the proof. And actually we are now going to, to deal, uh, speak about uh, Fourier multipliers. So, what are we talking about now? Well, I, I have a set of, uh, I have a, a subset of the, uh, of the lattice uh, associated with the Fourier coefficients of our functions. So I, I have a, a function here with these Fourier coefficients uh, uh, where the alphas run over the whole lattice. And then I restrict to this subset, this, this, uh, lambda subset of, of, of the integer lattice. So this I can do for any lambda. Okay, so that's the Fourier multiplier associated with the set lambda. And uh, then I'm interested in such Fourier, uh, Fourier multipliers that have norm one, okay, in, in LP. I mean, in, in L2, of course, all such uh, multipliers uh, have norm one, but we are interested in those that have norm one in uh, LP. And uh, frequently encountered examples of such operators or norm one uh, operators, Fourier multipliers of norm one, uh, are the, 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 there is an, uh, an inequality of, of F Wiener that you find in classical work of Bohr from uh, 1914, and, and there you just take an arithmetic progression. Okay, so any arithmetic progression in dimension one will give you such a, a, a Fourier multiplier. And this is an inequality that has been used both in one and several variables. Then another thing you can do is to t let lambda uh, be uh, uh, the uh, indices uh, associated with uh, uh, or with the M homogeneous terms of your um, Fourier series 
which means uh, the M homogeneous terms of your power series if you are in, in the HP case. And, and this is a quite useful thing to know that uh, this Fourier multiplier uh, has norm one. So roughly speaking, it just, it's, it's I mean, the trick to, to get it is that you uh, introduce a, a dummy variable and you see that you can get it from, from the fact that the Fourier coefficients of a one dimensional uh, function uh, are bounded by the norm of the function. So it's an easy thing to see, but it is useful. And, and people use it uh, both in operator, in number theory and in, in, in function theory. So uh, what we will do is to call lambda a contracted projection set for L, uh, LP if M lambda is such a uh, contractive uh, multiplier. So if it extends, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, if it extends to a contraction on, on LP. Okay, so let's, let me tell you what is known about this. So uh, I use a terminology introduced by, by Rudin. I, I say that lambda is a co set in ZD or you sometimes people also say it's an affine lattice. If it is a co-set of a subgroup of, of, uh, of the whole uh, lattice. So it's, uh, so it's just a, a, a subgroup that you have moved away by some shift. And uh, then uh, if you look at old papers by Andu and Rudin, you can extract for, from that the following uh, result that uh, in, if P is different from two, a subset uh, of ZD is a contracted projection set if and only if lambda is a coset in ZD. So somehow nothing very interesting happens, you could say, because it's not so hard to see that these co-sets will, will do the job. It's a bit like the F Wiener result, the classical F Wiener result, which is exactly the result in dimension one. This is just in some sense F Wiener uh, lifted to, to higher dimensions, but it's an if and only if, uh, result. And it, I mean, it's not it's not trivial, but it is not perhaps not so interesting in the sense that you don't see anything unexpected. Uh, I should say that well, I'm talking about contractive um, multipliers, but what about boundedness, right? You, when do you have boundedness of that Fourier multiplier? And and there there is an interesting thing to say about that. Uh, which is that in L1, you actually know when you have boundedness. And this is, uh, goes back to work of Helsen, Rudin, and, and, and later Cohen uh, in, in different settings. And, and the, the interesting thing here is that this uh, result uh, can be uh, related to the description given by, by, by these uh, people. So the result you have is that you have, you have a bounded Fourier multiplier on L1, if and only if you can write your set as a finite union of co sets. So finite unions, union of sets for which, you have, um, for which you have contractivity. And this extends uh, actually to, to compact abelian groups by, by a result of Cohn. However, you should also know that uh, if you want boundedness when P is not two or one, then you have a, 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 a difficult open problem to solve. So this is not, not, not known. So it's easier to deal with uh, nor one than just boundedness. Okay, so now we move to, to HP. So now you, you, only, you, you restrict to the so-called narrow cone uh, the non-negative integer, uh, uh, non-negative, uh, or the part of the lattice which uh, Helsen called the narrow cone, yes, which where you have only positive uh, ent entries of your points. And we say, uh, in analogy with what we said before, that uh, a contractive uh, that it is a contractive projection set if this uh, this uh, Fourier multiplier extends to a contraction on HP. Um, and of course, from what I told you before, it's clear that if I have a core set in ZD, uh, I take the intersection of that with a narrow cone, like here, then it is automatically a contractive projection set for HP. So, so the question is if there is anything more, if there is more to see here. And 
in order to uh, give you an answer to that, I need to uh, introduce some uh, something uh, uh, something in addition to what I, I told you before, because it turns out that that the dimension uh, not only of the space but also the dimension of the of your set lambda, meaning that you 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 have your set lambda, uh, it's it spans. Uh, some uh, some space, uh, some subspace, uh, or what we say the, the affine sp uh, span, right? So you take the vectors going between the points in in your uh, set, and you look at the dimension of that set. Uh, that is what we call the affine span. And uh, this actually plays a non-trivial role in this problem. So so you we we have then a, a k which lies between one and d, and we say that h p of TD enjoys the contractive restriction property of dimension K if every K-dimensional contractive projection set for HP is of the form given by this theorem that you had on the previous slide. In other words, when we have the contractive restriction property of dimension K, you could say that nothing uh, surprising happens, nothing unexpected, nothing new happens compared to what you have already in LP. Okay, so the dimension of the lattice, or sorry, the dimension of your set lambda uh, really plays a role. And now I will tell you what the theorem is. So the theorem consists of three parts and you should look, you should consider A as the low dimensional case, B the intermediate dimensional case and C the high dimensional case. So uh, low dimension, that is when D is two or the dimension of the set is one. So the points all lie on the line. Then nothing happens. Be, uh, and when P is two, of course, uh, it, this is a separate case, but for, for any P different from two, nothing new happens. So you have only the same same sets that you uh, that you got from the from the under Rudin theorem. Uh, however, when you are in the intermediate situation, when the dimension of uh, of uh, when d is three or, or d is equal to k is equal to three, or d is larger than or equal to three and the dimension of your set is two, then uh, uh, things uh, new things happen when p is four, exactly when p is four, you could have, you have uh, these uh, objects that, that are not covered by the under Rudin uh, theorem. And then when you go to high dimension, which you find in part C, actually there is a, a complete change in the sense that then not only four, but in fact, all for all even integers, uh, uh, new things happen. So you have additional sets, uh, subsets of the lattice that give you other uh, idempotent um, Fourier multipliers that are, not, that are not covered by the under Rudin theorem. So this is the, this is the content of this theorem. Uh, I, I will not make any attempt to explain the proof, but, but um, let me just say that the, the most interesting part, in some sense, I would say, is the, is the intermediate case, the case of intermediate dimension. So, um, and actually the two cases described here are completely different and they, they require uh, uh, completely different methods. What I, I will try to do is, is just to give you a feeling of uh, what, what this is all about. Uh, so that is on the next slide. So uh, you can, so this slide is about the, the geometry that, uh, that um, uh, uh, there is a geometric problem uh, related to the, the theorem uh, that is explained on this slide. So perhaps I should start uh, here uh, on, on uh, um, uh, here, so I have I have my set uh, I have my set um, uh, gamma now. Okay, so we are given a set gamma. I take a, a point uh, 
gamma in this set gamma. And what do I do? I, I start from this point and then I make vectors starting at gamma with the other points of your, of your set. And then um, what I do is I, I, uh, I look at how I can get from, from gamma taking these vectors to, to arrive at, an, uh, at a point lambda in, in the lattice that is, um, or, or th that is generated by, or no, sorry, not, not the lattice, but the call set, the call set that is generated by gamma. I mean, this set gamma will generate a call set. And I want to see how, when I have some point in the call set, how, how many steps do I need to get to that, to that uh, um, point of the call set? So, so I measure the distance uh, between my set gamma and uh, a point lambda of the call set by looking at all possible ways I can get from, from any point uh, here. And then I, it's important for me to, to take into account whether the uh, coefficients here are positive or negative. So I put the sum of the positive, uh, um, positive um, coefficients here and the negative coefficients here. And then I look at, first I take the, okay, I, I take the, the maximum of the positive contribution from the positive and the negative. And then, and then I take the in for all possible ways I'm able to arrive at a point of the call set. So in some sense, how far away uh, is the, is uh, the set, uh, sorry, the, 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 a given um, point of the call set from the original set gamma. And uh, the, uh, the point of doing all this is I want to understand how, how far, far, far do I need to go to, to get, I start in, inside of the narrow cone and I want to get to a new point in the narrow cone. But that point, in, the point I wish to reach in the narrow cone could be far away in this sense, in the sense I'm explaining now. So it, it could be that you, you have this course that generated by the set gamma and it lies, let's say, deep into the corner of the narrow cone. How far do I have to move to get back to the narrow cone when I start walking around generating uh, uh, new points in the in 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 this uh, call set generated by gamma. Uh, so uh, we then say that we, we speak about the n extension of of gamma, which consists of all those points that lie in the in the uh, call set, the intersection of the call set, this is the call set, lambda gamma, with the narrow cone, okay? So um, the n extension of gamma are those points, uh, lambda in this, uh, in this set, that are at distance uh, at most n from gamma. Uh, and uh, the description of of these um, contracted projection sets in these geometric terms is that a set in, in the narrow cone is a contracted projection set for the given HP space where you have now P equal to 2N plus one. Uh, it is a contracted projection set there if and only if the N extension of gamma is gamma so itself. So it means that you're not able to, to reach those points in the, in the call set that uh, lie far, that lie, um, uh, that, that lie far away in the narrow cone. Okay, so you, you are only, you are, you are sort of trapped. You are trapped uh, in, in the part of, uh, the, of the narrow cone where you, where you start. So the way to think about it is that when the dimension uh, grows, when the dimension gets higher, uh, the cone becomes more and more narrow in, in, the, in the corner at zero. So it's harder and harder to, to reach 
uh, new points in a narrow cone moving from the set that you started with. Uh, so in some sense, I would say that that this uh, this um, uh, what we observe here uh, really gives um, additional substance to uh, this uh, use of the term the narrow cone that Helsen introduced. So what you see with your eyes when you look at this problem is that that uh, it becomes more and more narrow. It's harder and harder to reach out when you start in, in, in inside, deep inside the narrow cone. So it's a, it's a very, I find it a very interesting geometric um, situation. And, and this is what is really behind this, this result that you saw on the previous slide. Okay, so then I want to tell you about some interesting consequence consequences of this not uh, it, it is actually a consequence of the examples because in order to prove uh, that you know that there are certain sets here that you didn't find with the under that that are not covered by the under rudin theorem and these sets you can use to cook up uh, exotic objects so one such exotic object you have on this slide okay so what we uh, what we find is that that you can cook up an explicit an explicit linear operator with the following property so tn is densely defined on hp on the infinite dimensional torus uh, for every uh, p between 1 and infinity but it extends to a bounded operator on hp if and only if p is uh, an even integer uh, between 2 and Two times n plus one, um, and 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 you may uh, observe that if you if you, uh, you you could take a look at a, a recent paper of Bayar and Mastillo who study uh, the possibility of interpolating between Hardy spaces on the infinite dimensional torus, and this really exemplifies this, I think, quite strikingly, the existence of such uh, exotic operators. Let me add to this that. You, you see that I, I stopped at n plus 2n, 2 times n plus 1 here, and you could certainly ask if you could find such a, a, an even more exotic operator that has this property for all even uh, integers. So it extends to a bounded operator on HP if and only if P is an even integer. And if you could solve this problem, you could also perhaps do something with the following problem that has been with us for many years. Namely, if you look at the Euclid series, I'm back to the Euclid series with uh, its their Vesikovich norm. So what we're doing is we are taking a Euclid polynomial again. So on the right hand side, you have the pth power of the p norm. And on the left hand side, you just integrate it on a segment, which is a half from the um, on, on the half line, half uh, the real part is one half. So the question is whether this inequality holds for for all p um, or um, for which p it it holds. And it is true when p is an even integer, and it is not true when p is between zero and, and two, which is a recent uh, remarkable theorem of Adam Harper. But for p different from two n. Uh, we don't know, but if this if it fails, then we would via the Bohr lift have the uh, our hands on uh, uh, such an exotic operator that I am talking about. And uh, well, it's not an operator here, but you can actually uh, cook up a composition operator, which takes care of the operator part of of the of the statement. So there is a very interesting relation, I think, here to this uh, embedding uh, problem that has been with us for, for many years. Okay, so I have five minutes more to go. So let me then spend the last five minutes on the fourth subject. So now we, we change our setup and we fix a function phi instead of fixing a set of frequencies, we fix a function phi. And, and we will say that a non-trivial function phi in HP 
uh, in any dimension is a Hilbert point in HP. If you have this um, contractive uh, property, so you take phi, add anything in the space, and f, anything in the space, means that f is orthogonal to phi in the usual L2 sense. Okay, so you add to phi uh, an f, which is orthogonal to phi, and you require that the norm increases. Of course, you could be worried here that if p is less than one, uh, this uh, wouldn't make necessarily sense, but you can put these technicalities aside because in fact, it turns out that mm -hmm. such a um, phi has to also belong to the dual space. So you can always make sense of it, but this is a small technical issue. So we will say that uh, a phi in HP with this property is a Hilbert point. And we use the term Hilbert point uh, simply to suggest that we are dealing with points in the Banach space around which the space locally looks like a Hilbert space. Okay, so it's, it's sort of a, it suggests that we we are in the in, in the Banach space, but locally the space looks like a Hilbert space, and and you can make more sense of it. I mean, the definition itself suggests it. If you want, you can also make a Banach space ge geometric interpretation. Uh, you can look at, um, uh, you can look at these, uh, these balls, right? And, and then uh, he, he, here is the ball BP, uh, which is just consists of those Fs with norm uh, smaller than uh, the normal phi. And then uh, the interpretation in geometric terms is that uh, this, the supporting hyperplanes T2 to B2 that contains the point phi coincides with the su supporting hyperplane TP uh, uh, to, to BP that contains phi. So you have this equality. So this is a, a Banach space geometric uh, interpretation of what we call Hilbert points. So what are these? Hilbert points and uh, why are they interesting? Uh, so what we uh, so so I will just list now the 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 things that we found in in our recent study of this. So uh, the first thing is that uh, you get the Hilbert point uh, by 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 solving uh, this this uh, nonlinear uh, equation. So here I take the Ries projection and 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 I get. And I take the the the, the uh, I plug in this 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 uh, function, and I require that uh, I get back phi uh, with some constant in front. Okay, so this comes from LP orthogonality. This is a, a rather uh, uh, obvious thing that you get this this um, um, the, you get your phi's uh, as solutions of this um, equation. Or LP orthogonality is the keyword for this. Uh, <clears throat> so then, in dimension one, uh, you can see that uh, you have a Hilbert point, or phi is a Hilbert point if and only if phi is a non-zero multiple of an inner function. So in dimension one, Hilbert points are just inner functions. Uh, then in higher dimensions. All inner functions will again be Hilbert points. I mean, you see this if you take a look at, at this e e equation. If you have an inner function, uh, this uh, power, this uh, p minus two power, uh, it will be one. So then, of, of course, your your your, your projection uh, is trivially uh, just a projection of phi. So you are back to phi. So it's clear that inner functions will be. Uh, uh, um, uh, Hilbert points in any dimension, but in the, but then it's interesting to look at various classes of uh, of uh, functions. And if you look at a one homogeneous polynomial, uh, which is a polynomial of this form in dimension D, then we can prove that it is a Hilbert point uh, in HP for p between two and infinity, if and only if the non-zero coefficients all have the same modulus. So these are precisely the Hilbert points of this kind. And by the way, uh, we were not able 
to prove this for p less than two. It's annoying, but uh, we were not able to do it. So that's a, that's an open problem. I don't know how to to do it. But uh, it turns out that this uh, way of thinking, uh, these objects, can actually be used to uh, prove uh, the sharp Kinchin inequality for Steiner's variables, uh, which is in our terminology, in the HP terminology, is just this uh, inequality for the for the coefficients of a, a, a one homogeneous polynomial. So a one homogeneous polynomial. Uh, has this precise uh, estimate. Um, we have this precise relation between the P norm and uh, the two norm and with this precise constant in front. So, um, well, uh, it's a new proof. I mean, the, this, this is a, a well-known result, but uh, I, I think maybe our proof <laughs> is not, it's quite simple. So it, it's, I think it's an interesting proof. Uh, then uh, what else, what, uh, what other, um, Hilbert points other, and just to give you an example of a situation where it is more complicated, I take uh, this uh, simple polynomial, uh, three homogeneous polynomial uh, in three variables. It is a Hilbert point in H4, but not in HP, uh, for any p other than two and four. So these Hilbert points may certainly depend on, on p when we are in, in higher dimensions. So, uh, well, uh, this is what we know about these Hilbert points so far. Uh, so I hope that uh, more can be said in the future. Uh, and then I just want to uh, finish by um, sort of repeating what I tried to say in the beginning, that these contractive inequalities are useful for various applications. And I think they are can be a tool to unravel some of the mysteries of these spaces, which we know too little about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we have time for questions. So if you have a question, then please just go ahead. Um, mm. Christian, a very naive question for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you also talked about, for, for short, about bounded operators, but the major part of your talk was about contractions. Yes. Is there any reason that uh, the constant be equal to one to be important in, in the proof? I mean, why you emphasize so much on contractions in, in, in your results? Well, there are several reasons for that. Uh, uh, the first was the, what I said in the beginning. My initial interest in this uh, uh, arose from inequalities that you lift in a multiplicative way, right? Mm -hmm. And when you lift them in a multiplicative way, and especially when you have infinitely many variables, you really need that they are contracted. Okay. So this is a, a one thing. And, uh, and, and in, I mean, when you are in infinite dimension, it's, it's you saw also with the Ries projection, right? Either it's one or it's infinite. Okay. So, uh, uh, and, and of course, when you come to, these item, item potent Fourier multipliers, I would say that, um, well, first of all, bounded operators are uh, uh, very hard. I mean, you, you really uh, uh, don't, you, it, it's really a hard, hard subject. And, and then uh, again, my motivation for, for, for looking at this was that I had been using these uh, such op such um, uh, inequalities that I, I, I mentioned as examples. So this with with homogeneous uh, polynomials, uh, for instance. So uh, we, were, we were just curious to, to understand, you know, uh, what else is there? I mean, what, what are, are these the only ones? I mean, when when do you have this very nice property that you have con contractivity? So, so I think. I mean, it's and and then 
I have to say that uh, when you look at these hardy Littlewood inequalities, hardy Littlewood, they did all these inequalities. I mean, all these inequalities are known, but they didn't care about the constant. And, and the constant in some cases is extremely interesting. Uh, it's, I, I find it very interesting that we know that the constant is one, but we have no clue of how to prove it. Uh, it it's an annoying situation. We are in dimension one. We should know everything in dimension one, but we don't. So I think there are many good reasons for, for doing it. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, if not, then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next week. <clears throat>